your Bibles this morning, let's turn over to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 38. Jeremiah chapter 38. We want to look or start out by looking at verse 1 down through verse 14 this morning. And so, Scott, could you start and read two verses and work our way back? And then after Josie and Shalom, we can pop back up here. Ebed Melech. Wayne, would you like to finish that? Let's open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, I pray as we look at this chapter in Jeremiah, Lord, that you give me the words to say. And Lord, I just pray that uh, you'd have us to learn lessons you'd have us to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So in chapter 38, we are nearing the end of the siege of Jerusalem in the reign of Zedekiah. As the time is drawing close, Jeremiah stayed true to the message that the Lord had given him concerning the fate of 
of Jerusalem, even in his current situation. Does anybody remember what happened last week, last chapter? What, what situation is Jeremiah in? He was in the prison. Okay. What was the events that took him there? Okay. What then? He was put in Jonathan's basement, and then, and then, no, that was this time. No, Zedekiah took him out to ask a question of him, and Jeremiah pl- pl- made his case and asked not to be put back in there, and Zedekiah put him in the court of the prison. What was the hidden blessing in being in the court of the prison? He had bread. He had bread. Okay? What did ebed melech just say to Zedekiah? No, ebed melech came to ask him to be taken out. And he said he'll die, and why? (laughs) He said he's going to die in there because there's no more bread in the city. So we know the time that's passed between last chapter and this chapter, and that time is that there's no more bread. Okay, so that there's been a time here. So these are not the same events, even though um, there's some people that say it's the same. And we read at the end of the chapter that they mentioned Jonathan's house again. And so there's just some people that say, well, maybe this is the same thing, just reiterated. But we know now, or we see that even Melech says, there's no more bread in the city. And Zedekiah said, put Jeremiah in the prison and give him bread daily. And so we know, so however much time that's been that the bread was, that there was bread and that there was no more bread, that's what's happened. Okay. So we see that um, Jeremiah was, was put in Jonathan's house, he was taken out, he was in the court in prison, he was given a daily ration of bread, but now we see the princes conspiring against Jeremiah again. So last chapter, it was the princes who put him in Jonathan's house so that he would die. They wanted to get rid of him. And again, we see another, they're, they're conspiring against him again because Jeremiah is still preaching from the, pri- court, pri- from the prison court. Okay? We see that in verse 4. It says, Therefore the princes said unto the king, We beseech thee, let this man be put to death, for thus he weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in the city, and the hands of all the people, in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt. Now what was Jeremiah preaching to the people? You said in verse 2 and 3. You need to go out to the Chaldeans, okay? And that was, that, that was their complaint. I asked the wrong question. Anyways, that was their complaint against Jeremiah, right? They were complaining that he was, well, I guess it wasn't. What were they complaining that Jeremiah was doing? He was saying surrender. They, he was hurting the morale, right? So I want to ask a question. Was this a valid complaint from the viewpoint of the defenders? Mm-hmm. Right. Well, yeah, and this is this this would be the end of those two years, right? Um, but yeah, it's, it's a valid viewpoint from the, end, from the point of view of the defenders. Is this a valid complaint from those who are loyal and patri- patriotic towards Judah? Right. Okay. And so while we would look at that and say, we, if, if we take off the... God glasses and put on the prince glasses, these princes, what were they trying to do? They were trying to hold on. They were trying to, to preserve um, 
Jerusalem. So I was doing a little bit reading about Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, and their conquest. And I, re- and I actually read that uh, there's records of the battle between Babylon and Egypt, the battle that we talked about last week. And they said that both sides, it was a stalemate. Babylon didn't beat Egypt into returning. And I, I said last week I wasn't sure if they were beaten or if Egypt just fell away. But I was reading last night, and they said that because there was a war, there was a battle between Babylon and Egypt in 603, 604, 603. And then there was another battle in 599, and Jerusalem fell in 598. And they said in both those battles, the first one, Nebuchadnezzar was attempting to conquer Egypt. There was an actual, because it was Egypt who stirred up the people, and Egypt quit paying tribute. And so Babylon came down, they were going to actually overthrow, and they could not get through. They, they met Egypt in the Sinai Peninsula, and they couldn't get through the army, and so he withdrew, and then he was fight, then Nebuchadnezzar was fighting, um, he was fighting some, some Arab um, tribesmen, some uh, uh, nomadic people, and then he had to return to Babylon because um, of an uprising. They, uh, history speculates that one of his brothers tried to, tried to overthrow him, and they said there's and they assumed that because there was, there, was, um, there was unrest back in Babylon, and then there's no more records of Nebuchadnezzar's brother from, 16, or from 602. There's no more about him. So they assumed that there was an uprising, and he had to go back to Babylon, put his brother down, and then they said that when he came back into, um, into well, Judah and laid siege on Judah... They said he was attempting to secure that whole area so that he could establish a strong point of which to completely overthrow Egypt. And they said that when Egypt came out, because Egypt had stirred up all them people, Moab and the Amorites and and Judah and all them other people that were around there to fight against them, when they had stirred those people up, they they came to Egypt and says, you need to come out and fight with us. So they said, history says that's why Egypt in uh, 599 came back out and Babylon came back down to the Sinai Peninsula to meet them. And they said it was a very costly battle for both sides. They said Babylon had a terrible amount of um, casualties. And so that gives us an idea of last week when we said that God told them, even if the wounded men, even if all that remained are wounded men, they'll still overthrow Jerusalem. And so that there, there was, it was actually a very costly battle for Babylon to fight Egypt, and now they're still trying to conquer Jerusalem. And so from the viewpoint of these princes who are trying to preserve Jerusalem, they think they have a fighting chance because they've seen the casualties of that 599 war, that battle against Egypt. They would have seen the amount of, of, of tents, and campfires that are gone, that are missing, they would be able to look out at the host and say, there's a lot less people here. So from a patriotic and a national standpoint, they had a valid concern or complaint against Jeremiah. But there's more going on than just, how do we say it? More than just, there's supernatural things going on. So, so there was, Jeremiah was telling them, and he had warned them that the defense won't make it. It will not last. God is going to overthrow that if only wounded men, or that term means run through, dying men would still overthrow Jerusalem. And he's telling them, you need to surrender. Now, they accused Jeremiah by saying that Jeremiah is... Um, that Jeremiah is hurting the people. The end of verse 4, it says, For this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt. Now, is this true? No, because what did Jeremiah say? He says, He that remaineth in, right, he said, he that remaineth in the city, whoever stays in here 
is going to die. And then Jeremiah says, but he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans shall live. So Jeremiah, he was looking out for Jerusalem. He was looking out for his fellow man by telling them, if you defend, you're going to die. If you go out, you will live. But that's counterintuitive. Right. 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 And and that's and they should have recognized that because Jeremiah isn't an up and coming prophet that's been unproven. He's been proven over and over again because he's prophesied of the downfall of Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachim. He's prophesied both the, down, the downfall of both them men, saying that they would fall, that Babylon would come and that they would fall, and that Egypt, that this would happen. And he's been proven true, while all the other prophets have said, there's going to be peace, peace, peace. And there's not been a lick of peace in the 40 years of Jeremiah's ministry. And, Jeremiah, and so Jeremiah's the proven prophet that they should have been listening to, and instead of looking at it from their point of view, they should have been looking at it from God's point of view. What Jeremiah doing was bad for patriotic morale, and it could even be seen as treasonous. They accused him of harboring the people rather than looking out for them, but Jeremiah had almost 40 years of ministry where he sought only to save Jerusalem and his people and had pleaded with God on their behalf. And so all it, took, all it would take is the recognition that Jeremiah is the prophet of God. Once they made that, once they admitted that, then they would have seen what Jeremiah was trying to do. That Jeremiah was trying to preserve the people by telling them, go out to the Chaldeans. If you go out to them, if you surrender, they will preserve you. They will, they, you will be saved. You won't die. And, but the people wouldn't do it. Now, that, that seems counterintuitive because what is the state between um, Judah and Babylon right now? Jerusalem is besieged, okay? They're in rebellion. It's not just war. This isn't conquest anymore. Now, conquest, if you surrender, you're preserved. But this is rebellion. This is civil war. And Nebuchadnezzar has a, um, history says that Nebuchadnezzar has a scorched earth tactic with those who rise up against him. And, it, and, it, and if speculation is true that he put down his own brother for rebelling against him, he's... They're looking at it by, and saying, you know, this man is not going to look lightly on us for rebelling against him. But God was telling them, you need to surrender, you need to submit, and he will preserve you. Okay? God was calling the people out from their defenses to give themselves to the enemy, and if they obeyed, they would be saved. Psalm 118, 8 through 10 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations come past me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. It is better to trust in the Lord. And that's what these people needed to do, is they needed to trust in God rather than in man and their princes. Yes? Oh, okay. So, there's this... They, they needed to turn to God, and they needed to obey God and trust in him for their defenses. And that's what Jeremiah has been telling them. Back in chapter 17, God, Jeremiah tells them to trust in the Lord. Trust in him for your defense. Don't trust in your city walls. Don't trust in what you're doing. Trust in God. Trust in him, and he'll lead you through. And yes, it may seem counterintuitive the way that God is going to preserve them, but that's how God works. He doesn't work how man thinks he should work. Because man thinks if God's going to preserve this city, and they've said it before, the priests have said before, this is his city. 
This is his temple. He won't let it be destroyed. But God would rather them obey him and do what he said than to have that city. But then on the other side, he told them, if you obey, I will preserve the city. There's a way of preservation for the city, and that way of preservation was the same way of salvation for the people. Okay? So these princes brought Jeremiah out of the prison court where Zedekiah had put him. They took him out of the prison court, and they demanded of Zedekiah that he should be put to death. What do we see was Zedekiah's response? Verse. It's later. What, happened, what happens in verse 5? Verse 5. We get mower. Now, what did Zedekiah say about himself? If I don't have the who am I? Right? What does he say there? He said, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king is not he that can do anything against you. He's just a puppet. And we talked about this last week, how Zedekiah has got no courage to stand up against his princes, to stand up against the nobles and stand up against the priests. He, he's got no courage there. He's got no fortitude. He's got no leadership. And so when the people came to him and said, Zedekiah needs to die, he goes, okay, I can't tell you no. Go ahead. Do it. And so they take him away. And they put him into this dungeon, the dungeon of Melchiah, the son of Hamelech, and... They say they let Jeremiah down with cord in verse 6. And in the dungeon there was no water and, but mire, so Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Now what's going on here is that Jerusalem has a large cistern system underneath the city. They said that Jerusalem never fell for lack of water. There was always water. And, they, and it was rediscovered during around the time of World War I. They rediscovered all these old cisterns and almost all these houses in their basement they had these cisterns or these wells where the water where there were springs that would fill them and so everybody had their own well system pretty much everybody had their own well system in their homes but in this in this place in this cistern it says that there's no water there's only mire or mud and so they let Jeremiah down in it and Jeremiah sunk down into the mud and they left him there to die I know that they said that there's a few places where Jerusalem had its own springs and it was less water coming into the city. Um, but pr late, earlier on, I forget what chapter we looked in, but they said that there was a drought, that the people were talking about a drought. So it could have been a drought. It could have been a lack of water. Um, it could have been that they were cutting off and certain cisterns were cut off when Babylon cut their water off. But Jerusalem had some pools. Um, I don't know. I don't know why, but this one had no water in it. It was just mud, and Jeremiah was let down into it. Okay? So, Zedekiah would not stand up against them. And Jeremiah, Zedekiah's excuse is, the king is not he that can do anything against you. Now, what is the role of a king? Or what was his role? To lead. That was exactly what Zedekiah had the power to do, is to tell them, no, no, you can't. That's the king's prerogative to determine who should be put to death and who shouldn't be put to death. We, said that, we see that with Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where he says, if anybody doesn't bow, they're going to be cast in the fire. And when they bring them before the, when they brought them before Nebuchadnezzar, he gave them a second chance because that was his prerogative. He could do that. Um, we see uh, when Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, he's done, he ha that happened because Darius commanded it. Darius wrote the law. 
and he disobeyed the law, and according to his law, that could not be changed, he had to be, but that's the king's prerogative to determine who should and who shouldn't be put to death on these situations, okay? There is a reason, or this is the reason why God commanded Zedekiah through Jeremiah. We've seen that, we've seen that a few times in the past where Jeremiah comes to Zedekiah and he tells them to execute judgment and righteousness, because that's the, that's the king's duty, is to judge justice and righteousness. And, if, and we can almost look at that as a buildup of God telling Zedekiah, you need to do this. You need to get into the habit of doing this, of standing firm, of doing what is right, doing justice and righteousness. Because God knew there was going to come a point where Jeremiah's life was on the line, and it was up to Zedekiah to decide, yea or nay. Yes or no, is he going to live or not? And if Zedekiah had gotten into that habit of doing what God had told him to do, doing the duty of a king, Zedekiah would have told them, no. No. I had the power to tell you no. I am the king who can stop this. Can, let's reverse what he says in verse 5. I am he that can do something against you. I am he. I can tell you no and you're going to listen to me. But instead we see this, this habit of Zedekiah to back off and say, whatever you want, that's fine. Do what you're going to do. God commanded the kings to execute judgment and righteousness to keep evil men in check. Jeremiah is then lowered into the cistern and left in the mud to die. But, let's look at verse 7. Now when ebed melech the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, the king then sitting in the gate of Benjamin, ebed melech went forth out of the king's house and spake to the king, saying, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon, and he is like to die for hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city." Ebed-Melech had compassion for Jeremiah, but he also had courage because where does he confront, where does he confront Zedekiah? And he says he goes, Zedekiah was in the gate of Benjamin and Ebed-Melech left the king's house to go talk to him. This wasn't in the chamber this wasn't in the court. This wasn't in the, the throne room. This was in the gate, the city gate, in a public place. Eben Melech confronted the king and said, what these men have done is evil. There was courage in Eben Melech to, in public, tell the king what the princes did was evil. They've done wrong. And so he confronts Zedekiah. And then what, what, do he, what do we see Zedekiah do? Verse 10, Then the king commanded Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take from hence thirty men with thee, and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he die. So when Zedekiah is confronted by a man with courage, who knows what is right, Zedekiah Gives in, um, stands up. I'm trying to think of a word. He goes along with what is right when there is a man of sufficient courage for Zedekiah to follow. Yeah, and he he comes around. But Ebed-Melech is what Zedekiah was supposed to be. But when Ebed-Melech comes to him, Zedekiah says, take from hence, from the guard, from the gate guard, 30 men. Take 30 men from the defenses, from the guard of the gate, from the walls, wherever, whatever, wherever these 30 men were. It says, take from hence 30 men and get him out. Now, Ebed Melech doesn't say that Zedekiah did wrong, and he doesn't tell Zedekiah that you've got to go out and do that. He just tells Zedekiah he's going to die in there. And Zedekiah says, okay, 
take 30 men and get him out. And so Ebed Melech goes and he rescues Jeremiah and he goes and he takes Jeremiah out of the pit. And he's got these 30 men with them. And now I read one commentator that said Ebed Melech would not have needed 30 men to draw Jeremiah out of the cistern. They said it's probably a misprint. He probably would have only needed three men. And yes, to pull him out of the mud, three other men probably would have been enough. But is that why Zedekiah sent 30 men? No, it's because he's going against the will of his princes. And those princes have house guards. And those princes have authority. And those princes have, um, they have uh, influence in the city. And Zedekiah said, okay, we're going to take a force with you to do it so that they know that I'm act- this is what I want. This is actually, I'm standing up against them, and if they want to stop my order, they're going to have to fight it. Now, they, didn't, they still weren't fighting Zedekiah for it. it was, they were going to fight Zedekiah's men, but it was under Zedekiah's order. Go with enough force that they cannot go against the king's command. So we see this up and down in Zedekiah, where Zedekiah knows what's right. He doesn't have the courage to do it. But like last chapter we saw in secret, he took him out and put him in the court when he didn't have to be, when he wasn't opposed by anybody. But now when he's confronted in public about it and there's people there, this is where, this is where everybody sits and congregates, is in the city gates. And in this public place, Zedekiah gives the command that, that ebed Melech is to take a force and remove Jeremiah from the dungeon. Okay. Then we see that ebed Melech went and he took the men. And he took him thence, in verse 11, and took thence old cast clouts and old rotten lags, rags and let them down by cord into the dungeon to Jeremiah. So this is further compassion in Ebed Melech, in that Jeremiah is sunk in the mud, and in order to remove him, they're going to have to pull really hard. Dad had a goat stuck in the mud earlier on, and he called Dalton and I, and we went over there, and you couldn't hardly pull a goat out, a goat in the mud. Jeremiah is sunk in the mud, and it's going to take an effort to get him out. And Eben Melech takes these old rags to cushion the rope that was going to pull Jeremiah out. So there was thought and there was compassion in Eben Melech's, in what Eben Melech was doing. Number one, because Jeremiah was getting up, he was getting older. He's at least 60. And this was going to put a strain on him, and there was compassion there. That just shows that there's just extra compassion that Eben Melech showed the prophet of God. And he was fulfilling his duty, but he was doing it in a way, he was showing kindness um, above that of just rescuing him. Okay? He took him out. They drew Jeremiah out in cords, took him out of the dungeon, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Verse 14, Then Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing, hide nothing of me. What he's saying is, I'm going to ask counsel of you. Don't hide the bad news from me. Tell me, tell me the truth. What's going to happen? So he asks, he asks counsel of Jeremiah, and Jeremiah gives him this response. Verse 15, then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, if I, de- or well, first he says, if I declare unto thee, wilt thou not surely put me to death? And if I give thee counsel, wilt thou not hearken unto me? So he's saying, if I tell you and you don't like it, you're just going to put me to death. And then he says, and if I tell you, you're not going to listen to me anyways. But verse 16, so Zedekiah the king swore secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. 
So he promised that he wouldn't kill him, but he didn't promise to listen to him. So Jeremiah tells him, thus said, Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live and thine house. But if thou wilt go forth, but if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. So he's given them two options here. Surrender, and the city won't burn. You will be preserved, and your house will be saved. He said, don't surrender. You will be captured. The city will burn, and your house will fall. But then we see Zedekiah's response. And Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hands and they mock me. So what was, what was Zedekiah's fear? To be made fun of, to be mocked. But there's a problem with what Zedekiah is saying. What did Jeremiah tell Zedekiah to do? Who was he to go surrender to? the princes. Zedekiah says, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen away, those Jews that have already gone over to the Chaldeans, lest they reveal me, deliver me into their hands. Verse 20, but Jeremiah said, they shall not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I spake unto thee, so it shall be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. But if thou refuse to go forth, this is the word the Lord hath showed me, Okay, I'll get to that in a second. Here's the, here's the thought that I had last night. Jeremiah is telling the people to go to the Chaldeans, right? We see here that Zedekiah says, I'm afraid of these people that have gone over to the Chaldeans. What does that tell us then? Okay. Well, those people that have gone over to the Chaldeans... They've obeyed. We assume it, we can assume maybe. We don't know that for sure. Yes. Proportionally, most of them probably obeyed Jeremiah. Maybe they obeyed. Maybe these really are traitors that are looking to get some money off of showing the Babylonian army how to overthrow Jerusalem. But it is possible and it is very likely that these men, these people, are the people that obeyed Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah says, they won't turn you over. If these were people that have got tra betrayed Judah and are looking for money, yeah, they're going to deliver the prince up. But Jeremiah said, they won't. So we assume that these are people who obeyed. Okay? So first, if those who were leaving the city were obeying Jeremiah and taking that road of salvation that God had offered them, they would rejoice to see their king walking the same path. This is the path. That, there's two paths given in Zedekiah, the path of, path of salvation and the path of destruction. And Jeremiah is telling them they won't give you up. Those who are saved, let's put it in today's, in the church mindset, those who are saved don't mock somebody in high position who gets saved. There is rejoicing for that. Jeremiah says, they won't. They'll rejoice over it because the king is preserving the whole city. Okay, so that's the first, first thing I noticed last night. Second thing I noticed is Zedekiah was missing the whole point of the offered salvation. Okay, why? Because Zedekiah was, let me get back on point. If he was to surrender... He was supposed to hand himself over to Nebuchadnezzar's princes. But Zedekiah was saying, if I go out, they're going to deliver, they're going to wrap me out. He was going to try to go out and hide amongst those that have already obeyed. The point was, he was supposed to surrender himself. He was supposed to give himself up. He was go, supposed to go out in complete obedience. He completely missed the salvation that God was offering him. He was to take responsibility for his rebellion, to take responsibility to, to, 
to assume the consequences of what was going to happen to him. He was to go out and in full obedience say, here I am. I've rebelled against the king. I'm giving myself up. And a lot of times there's people that miss the point of salvation. They completely miss it. They com- it goes right over their head what it is they're supposed to do. And what they're supposed to do is complete surrender. Completely give it. People that go, well, do, do I got to do this if I get saved? Do I, do I got to do this? Well, pe- well, people, and it's like, the point is, is you're getting right with God. That's the point. Not you're getting out of something. Not, no, you're getting right with God. And, and you're giving everything up and giving yourself to God. And that's what Zer- Jeremiah was telling Zedekiah to do. But Zedekiah wouldn't do it. He was afraid. And worldly speaking, rightly so, Nebuchadnezzar was not a teddy bear of a man. He, he wasn't going to be good. Well, it was. But the, <laughs> the examples that Zedekiah has were not pretty. But God was telling him, trust me, he's my, Nebuchadnezzar is my vassal. He's my tool I'm using him. This is not him, his doing. It's my doing. And if I say he will preserve you, he will preserve you. He just had to obey. Jeremiah then pleads with the king and warns him of what would happen to him and his house if he would not hear and obey the counsel of the Lord. But Zedekiah still refuses to listen. And so Jeremiah tells him what would happen. Um, that he would, he would fall, if he wouldn't obey, he would fall into the king's hand. The city would be burned with fire. Verse 23, it would be burned with fire. Verse 24, then said Zedekiah unto Jeremiah, let no man know of these words, and thou shalt not die. But if the princes hear that I have talked with thee, and they come unto thee, and say unto thee, declare unto us now what thou hast said unto the king, hide it not from us, and we will not put thee to death. Also what the king said unto thee. So Zedekiah knew that the princes would find out about this meeting, and they would want to know what, the, what he's talking to Jeremiah about. And so he tells them, verse 26, Then thou shalt say unto them, I presented my supplication before the king, that he would not cause me to return to Jonathan's house to die there. So he tells them, if they ask you what happened, just tell them that you were bringing your supplication before me, that you were pleading with me not to be thrown back in... Jonathan's house, or even into that dungeon, into the cistern. It says, just tell him that you came and pleaded your life with me. And we see there that the princes did come, verse 27. Then came all the princes unto Jeremiah and asked him, and he told them according to all these words that the king had commanded. So they left off speaking with him, for the matter was not perceived. So Jeremiah abode in the court of the prison until the day that Jerusalem was taken, and he was there when Jerusalem was taken. So Jeremiah told them what the king told him to tell him. He only told them that he was pleading for his situation, and the princes left that alone. They left him there, and that was the end of it. And Jeremiah was left in the king's court. So notice that after Zedekiah used force to remove Jeremiah from their grasp, the princes left him alone in the court of the prison. As soon as Zedekiah used force to stand up for Jeremiah, the princes left him alone. If he had done that in the first place, Jeremiah wouldn't have had to put up with anything the princes did because the princes would have realized that Zedekiah was using force was actually on Jeremiah's side. So, all right, any thoughts or questions before we close?